Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Mission Dharma. I am Mary Davis. I am probably familiar to most of you. Um, I am uh, on the board here at Mission Dharma, volunteer, um, taught here before. I have a Sangha in Richmond, Insight Richmond. And it's always a thrill to be um, in the seat, a little daunting, but um, a thrill that I have been entrusted with this seat. So, um, you know what, let's do the hellos after the sit, if you don't mind, just, just because um, folks are still showing up and, um, All right, and today my my trusty co-host is is Howie Gelman. So thank you, Howie, for being here. All the support, and we're really going to try to get through this without a cat jumping into the screen view. But if that happens, um, <laughs> cats happen. I've got a new. He's he's not a kitten kitten. He's a young cat, and um, he hasn't quite learned how to be polite yet. So. Anyway, um, so I want to invite you to um, find your posture, just be really and to be intentional about finding, finding a seat that feels supportive, that feels that touches into this inner dignity. So an uprightness to it. And really just taking a moment to, to do that transition to, to recognize that how we're going to be placing our bodies in a way that feels easeful, respectful, and kind. So do whatever you need to do in terms of adjustment with zhuzhing any pillows or blankets. Sometimes it's helpful to sort of move back and forth, maybe find your center. And really just invite this sense of settling in. This transition from the world of talking and working and chores, news, where we've come from. So this transition to a more inward gaze, transition to silence. Just bringing in any stray bits of attention and awareness that are still out there, wherever out there is, and just inviting them in, just inviting it in to this field of awareness that is the body. Sensing into the presence of the body. And sensing the grounding with the earth, the earth element of our bones meeting the earth element of the earth. Feeling how the earth supports us, holds us. Also recognizing how we're being held by those who are also here with us, here in this virtual circle. Again, sensing that sense of support and care. You know, our practice is never for ourselves alone. We practice for those who are near or dear, those known, unknown. We practice to help heal this troubled world. It's 
So bringing this light of awareness into this, into the body. Again, sensing that contact with the earth. Contact with the seat. Maybe even a sense of grounding down through the sits bones. Feeling the touch of the hands as they rest in our lap or on the arm, the chair. And touch of the lips and the eyelids. And with all the care in the world, just scan through the body and see if there's any places that need to be released where we can soften, we can let go. Places where we may chronically hold on to our tension. Maybe it's around our eyes or our jaw. Allowing that to go slack. Our neck and our shoulders. Just inviting the sense of melting. Maybe there's tightness around your heart center or your belly. Seeing if we can release and open. As the mind and body start to quiet, we can I detect more subtle sensations. Maybe you feel some tingling or some pulsing or itching or you may sense movement of our whole body as we breathe. Expansion with the in-breath, relaxation with the out-breath. Just noticing how the body breathes itself. Allowing ourselves to let go of doing. Letting go of trying to be someone, especially a good meditator. Just allow ourselves to settle into the waves of breath, the rising and the falling.
And it can be helpful to check in on the quality of our awareness. Is there a sense of spaciousness? Is there kindness? Is there acceptance? The mind may wander off to thoughts, future, past, etc. what's for dinner. And can we very kindly just invite invite our mind back home to this body, to this breath, without any judgment, no harshness.
It's never too late to begin again. And again. And again.
So that brings our sit to a close. So just allow yourself to gently transition. Take a nice stretch or drink water. There actually was a bell, but I had myself muted. <laughs> so anyway, welcome back everyone. Good to see you all. So um, before we head into announcements and whatnot, I just like everyone to invite everyone to unmute themselves, open up their camera for a moment and just greet everyone in the room. Say hello, maybe where you're from. Hello all. Hi, Mary. Hello. Hi. 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 Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Hi from Berkeley. Hi, everyone. Hi, British Columbia. Hi, from Tucson. Hi. Big love. Big love from Hi, everyone. Oakland. Palm Springs. Hi, everyone. Nice. Hello. <laughs> All right. Well. So welcome everyone. It's good to see you. Our far-flung Sangha from Canada and Nashville and locally. So um, all right, I'm just going to hand it over to um, Mr. Gelman, to Howie Gelman for um, some short announcements. Oh, okay. Um, everyone. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I am the other Howie, so uh, <laughs> please don't confuse me. <laughs> uh, how dare I? Um, well, look, uh, two quick things today. One is uh, all of uh, all of us have hopefully received a request to fill out the survey that was uh, emailed to us last week, and. Uh, um, uh, there was also a, a mention about it in the reminder email too. So um, I did it. It's very, it's very uh, short, but it's also very uh, uh, clear. And I think it's going to really help people uh, help us figure out what's going forward in terms of, um, uh, you know, the future, hopefully a future that's less, um, uh, that's determined by COVID you know, where we could actually get a place and how we would integrate folks from, you know, afar and near and location, et cetera. So if you haven't, if you, I mean, you're all here, so you obviously click the link, but if there's some reason why you haven't gotten the, um, the, the, the request, uh, then uh, actually maybe Mary later in a moment can tell you how to email so you could get onto the mailing list if you're not already. But I assume most of us are. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is Donna. And um, uh, for those of you who are new or like hearing this, uh, I'll just remind you that Donna is the ancient practice of showing gratitude for the teachings and for the teachers and the volunteers and everyone that keeps this sangha going. Uh, Everything is done uh, voluntarily, and um, whoever's sitting in the teacher's chair, like Mary is today, is doing it because of uh, she's making her donation of time and wisdom. And uh, uh, it costs a little money um, to make this happen uh, for the last thousands and thousands of years. And... I don't want it to stop on our watch. So I think uh, it's, uh, aside from act being, for those who can afford it, um, it, it, being generous towards something that's really helping yourselves and the world, you know, I think it's a no brainer, but there actually is a great sense of joy that I get doing it. But I will just say this, um, sometimes I forget. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm deciding to do it. And then the next day, uh, I realize I haven't done it, or the next week. So um, 
uh, if you are interested in doing it, and I, I hope uh, that most of us can afford it, whatever, whatever amount that is, just tie a virtual string around your finger. And as soon as this, sit, uh, as soon as this uh, meeting is over, uh, you can do it. If you're not sure how, uh, I, in the chat, which I think everyone is, has access to, I have listed the three or four ways you can do it. Plus, uh, if you go online, you can, you can find that too. But the main thing is, uh, um, it's, it's the kind of responsibility that I find to be a joyful one. So uh, I, hope you, I hope you guys uh, feel that way too. Anyway, back to you, Mary. All right, thank you, Hallie. And in fact, um, we're gonna take a quick bio stretch and it could be a Donna break. You can just take care of your Donna now, you're done. Um, so why don't we come back at, 757. That gives us six minutes. Okay. So I will meet you back here in a few minutes. Where's the kitten? Sherman? Where'd he go? Sherman? He's gotten himself more trouble, has he? Sherman? Mary, I just want to remind you that you may have your microphone on. Mary, I just want to remind you that you may have your microphone. <laughs> I just want to remind you.
So it's funny, six minutes is a lot longer than I, uh, It's a lot, lot, feels a lot longer than one would think. So um, thank you, Howie, for changing the view there. So looks like most every, we haven't lost anybody, that's good. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start. So um, yeah, as I was- the camera? Mary? Yes. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's funny when I'm not when I'm not in the co-pilot seat being sort of the technical director, I completely forget all of you know muting, unmuting, etc. So thank you for that reminder. Um, so it was interesting when I was putting together the survey um, and I was counting on my fingers, you know, how long we've been been at this and came to the conclusion that it's almost 20 months. You know, it's, it's, and not just 20 months of doing this on Zoom. You know, this has actually been a really pleasant um, thing that's come from the, from the pandemic. The fact that we can have, you know, friends in Canada and Arizona and Texas and all of, and Nashville. Um, you know, so that's, that's been really lovely, but it's 20, 20 months of this, of this pandemic you know, 20 months of, of frustration and anxiety and grief. You know, we're, we're tired of, of waiting. We're tired of grieving. We're just tired. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can definitely just say it's just, it just wears one down after a while. And then of course, um, next week we're starting, yeah, I guess next week, um, we were just days away from the holiday hype. And uh, it used to be it didn't start until after Thanksgiving. Now it's after, now it's after Halloween. And so then we're going to have all of that additional pressures, you know, and, and we're not back to normal yet by, by any means. I mean, last year, we're better than last year where a lot of people sacrifice seeing their loved ones um, in order to stay safe and to keep others safe. Um, this year we're negotiating all sorts of things. I mean, there's different guidelines and people's different levels of safety and different beliefs on the vaccination. So, you know, it's, um, it's gonna be a challenging holiday season, I think. So, you know, it's, it's one of the words in response to this sense of, um, of just sort of, you know, communal exhaustion. Um, you know, you hear a lot about self-care. It's become a bit of a buzzword. It's even, you know, you hear my employer is doing a lot of, you know, tell, don't forget your self-care. Go take a walk around the block or go have a cup of tea or, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of this way of keeping people propped up um, and moving on when actually they're just feeling burnt out and really weary and just needing some deep, deep rest. And there's nothing wrong with self-care. You know, sometimes a spa day, a walk in nature, a hot bath, okay, I knew this was gonna happen, um, or whatever you need to do to recharge um, is great. You know, I encourage it. Um, but the problem with a lot of these self-care actions is that they're really just merely stopgap measures. You know, they're, they're, this, they're a temporary cessation of, of our distress. And we need to keep doing them, right? So to sort of keep the, the, the stress at bay, you know, so we, we're engaging in more, it's like, okay, I need my walk in nature because I'm going to lose my mind, you know? So it's, um, you know, and I think with any sort of, um, thing that we're doing is sort of a, a measure to sort of um, stop the suffering or to dampen it in some ways is that it stops working. You know, maybe we'll find something else and we'll do that for a while and that will be helpful. Um, but it becomes this endless quest and it doesn't get us any nearer, you know, our actual goals of, of a more stable happiness or a sense of of peace in our life. 
So tonight I want to talk about how we can care for ourselves in a way that that cultivates, that allows us to grow this greater sense of resilience and peace. And so we've heard Howie and other teachers, you know, talk about the Brahma Baharas, the divine abodes, these immeasurable qualities of the heart. So there's metta, loving kindness, karuna, compassion, uh, mudita, sympathetic joy, and upeka, equanimity. And uh, tonight I'd like to focus on metta, loving kindness, and karuna, compassion. And in particular about self metta and self compassion. So I'm I'm curious before I get started, um, how many of you have um, a metta practice? And if you have a metta practice, how do you practice? Is it a regular part of your practice? Is it as needed? Is it a retreat practice? Um, so you can go ahead and just type that in the chat box. I'd just be interested in in knowing what. Um, you know, how you, what your meta practice is like. And it's okay if you don't have one too. Just curious. As needed, as needed in retreats. Yes, intensive time doing meta. Yeah. Anyone else? Or maybe just a show of hands. How many folks have a meta practice? Oh. Eh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so kind of, sort of, yeah. yeah. And some have more, more gratitude pretty much daily as needed and retreats, excellent. Okay, so it, it varies. Um, so I think there's this tendency, because I know I had it too, um, to view our meta practice as a bit of an add-on sort of a nice to have. Maybe we do it when we're feeling, we're feeling called to it. Maybe our heart needs to warm up a little or we have a friend who is, is struggling and we want to send them some meta or maybe we're struggling. Um, I know that I will drop into meta sometimes when um, I find I'm, I'm having a sit and my mind won't settle, right? It's the mind is already sort of churning. So it's like, okay, let's just use that energy and you know do the phrases and do some meta. But I recently was reminded um, when I was going through the Eightfold Noble Path with my Insight Richmond uh, Sangha, that metta and compassion are included in the second step of the Eightfold Path. They're right there in right intention or sometimes called right thought, right intention or right thought. So the practice of metta and our compassion are not a nice to have, they're integral to our path of, of awakening. So in this second, second step in the Eightfold Path, you know, we're recognizing what kind of thoughts and actions lead to happiness and what leads to suffering. So as Buddha said, and what monks is right thought, the thought of renunciation, the thought of non-ill will, the thought of non-harmfulness. This monks is right thought. So the thought of renunciation is this antidote to greed, to greed and desire, but I'm not gonna talk about that tonight. The thought on non-ill will is this antidote to ill will. And this non-ill will is what? It's metta, right? And the thought of non-harmfulness is the antidote to harm, and that's compassion. So the Pali word for metta, as you're probably more than aware, is uh, as a term, it means loving kindness. But it gets all sorts of people have their preferences for what word they use. Um, so some will say friendliness, goodwill, benevolence, uh, a universal love. Uh, some people prefer to focus on the kindness part of loving kindness, just because love can be such a loaded term um, in our culture and it gets sort of mixed up with attachment. Um, you know, attachment always leads to suffering versus love will always lead to, to happiness. So um, it's however you, how, you know, I mean, the beautiful thing about this practice is that there's this sense of, of 
creativity to it. So it's like you have to find what sort of resonates for you. And so if loving kindness doesn't resonate for you, maybe it's, it's friendliness. You know, oh yeah, I can, I can do friendliness. Loving kindness, maybe that's a big, a big ask. You know, the same particularly when we start, you know, for the difficult person or whatnot, it's like, I can be kind, maybe not so much loving, but I can do kindness, right? So again, sort of, you know, don't get caught up in, in, um, in, in the terminology, find what works, what works for you. You know, Meta is also, uh, uh, also described as a strong wish for the welfare and happiness of others, including ourselves, including ourselves. So and it's not something that's external to us. It's not something that we are trying to attain or achieve, right? Metta is the natural state of our mind when it's free from defilements like attachment, aversion, and delusion, right? So, and, and we've all experienced metta. We all, it's, it's familiar to us. It's not a foreign state of mind. You know, we've probably experienced this with our friends and our families. Pets are a great source of metta, right? They're just, they're, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's these relationships where our heart feels open, receptive, and we're not harboring any ill will. We wish nothing but the best for them. And so that's, that's experience of metta that we can, we can touch into when we're sort of, um, when we think about it. And of course, our relationship, our human relationships um, tend to be kind of a mixed bag. Uh, it's not all meta all the time. You know, our loved ones can be um, sometimes, sometimes we're not feeling so, so loving and kind, or they're mixed up with attachment, right? That sort of grasping and holding on. So just this understanding that, you know, our relationships are not all, all pure and they're complex. So. <clears throat> we may derive a lot of benefit from the practice of metta. I mean, you know, that's why, I mean, a lot of times people will sit down to do a metta practice when they feel like they need it. They need that sort of sense of whether it's soothing or just getting in touch with their heart, um, a softening. But metta itself doesn't, seek any self-benefit. It's not our intention, right, to, to make ourselves feel better. We don't send metta with the ex expectation of, of getting something in return, right? It's, it's this intention practice, where this intention of opening the heart, of opening the heart to ourselves, opening our heart to others, just big, 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 so that everyone gets included in this big heart. So it's this gateway to, to an open heart. But we can't expect, you know, we, we don't put expectations on it. We just drop these intentions in the bucket over and over again. May you be happy. May you be safe. So for those of you who do have a meta practice, you, you, know, you know that the formal meta practice is a repetition of phrases of well-being. So wishing for ourselves happiness, wishing for ourselves and others, happiness and peace, safety and protection, health and strength and, and ease and well-being. And we repeat these phrases as we bring to mind different muses. So, you know, we'll send it to ourselves. We send it to a benefactor, somebody who has helped us, um, a good friend, a neutral person, a difficult person, and then all living beings, right? So it, it's just, it, it, it just broadens out and there's a level of difficulty, right? With each level. It's like, okay, the heart's warmed up. Can I include this too? Can I include this too? Can I include everybody? And so the, the, the logic behind this order is that we start where it's easy. And then, and then we increase the challenge, you know, each step opening the heart a little bit more. But 
you may have noticed um, there are some teachers and myself included um, who switch around the order of the muses. And they may start with having you focus on the benefactor or good friend, right? Someone that we easily connect to and the phrases come naturally and sincerely. You know, there's no hesitation. It's like, oh yes, I'm thinking of this person and may you be happy, may you be safe. You know, it's just this natural outpouring of our caring, right? And so this gets the heart sort of warmed up, right? And then maybe after we're sort of, you know, uh, like I said, warmed up, um, then maybe there's enough juice to bring ourselves into the mix, right? You know, the Buddha, the, you know, I, I think back in Buddha's day when it sort of, like, you know, they came up with this order. Yeah, they, they, they were probably a lot less neurotic and not subject to the same sort of messages and culture and everything else that, that, um, that we have to face. So if you have problems with the self meta, um, with the self meta portion of the practice, you're not alone. You know, we may have some views of ourself that we're bringing into practice. We may see ourselves as unworthy, or maybe we have some ideas that it's selfish to wish well for ourselves, especially when there are so many people who are struggling. Or maybe it's just a completely foreign concept. Wish myself well, what's that all about? I remember um, years ago, and I think it was Howie, I think it was Howie who sort of prescribed for me um, a self meta practice. And because um, I had done some meta practice and then it was like, well, no, just focus on self. And I remember when I just started focusing on, on self meta for the life of me, I could not, I couldn't even remember the phrases. You know, the, the block was so deep that it was like, may I be, what is that? Oh, right. Happy, happy. Yeah. I want to be happy. Um, yet when I started sending them to others, boom, 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 not a problem. So, you know, it's, um, it can be challenging. And there made this urge to sort of bypass ourselves. Let's, you know what? I don't need to include myself in all of this. Others are the ones who are important. But we, if, we're miss, if we're skipping our own meta, sending meta to ourselves and understanding that, we're really skipping over this, this foundation of wishing wells to others. Because if we can't, and if we can't include ourselves, we're also just furthering this, this barrier building you know, this wall between ourselves and others. I'm different from others, right? And part of meta is breaking down that line between self and others. And so if we're just like, oh, well, I'm, I'm outside of the circle, you know, where that's not the point of, of meta or one of the points of meta. And so we need to be able, so when we're sending ourselves meta, we need to be able to, to feel our own longings for happiness and peace, for safety and protection, for health and ease. You know, because how else can we really understand how deep that longing is for, for others? You know, there's this implicit phrasing that just as I wish to be happy, may you be happy. Just as I wish to be safe, may you be safe, right? So it's this, this, this equalizing, this, this bridging between, between self and others. So we can't, we can't skip that, that, that step. It's our connection. Because every, every living being wants to be happy and no one wants to suffer. Now we all have different ways that we may define happiness, but everybody shares this, this, this deep wish, I wanna be happy. 
you know, animals and insects and, you know, everybody wants to be, feel like they have shelter and they're protected and they're warm and cared for. Everybody, no matter how deluded they may be. You know, we all share this really deep wish and we don't wish to suffer. So what happens when we don't see this commonality, if we leave ourselves out and we don't recognize this commonality between ourselves and others, is that we do start to, to other folks, right? We, we start to strip them of their humanity. Well, they aren't like us, or I'm not like them, right? And, what, and that's the basis for you know, all the wars and genocide and racism, and homophobia, et cetera, et cetera, is this, this separation between ourselves and others or creating this camp versus that camp. And that camp always, we don't see them as fully human. We don't see how we're, how we're con what we have in common. You know, and we see this so much in our culture. I mean, it's just, and it's been going on for years, whether it's politics and now it's COVID. Um, and there's this complete befuddlement uh, about the, quote, the other side. It's like, for instance, I honestly don't understand why people won't get vaccinated. It really, I just, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand it. And especially when they're sort of, you know, fighting to not be vaccinated. Um, yet, if I can remember that these people who are, who I may disagree with vehemently, yet I can also understand, you know, fighting for what I believe in. I can also understand feeling excluded. Um, so, you know, there's that, that bridge. Like I said, I don't agree with what they're doing, but that's a human being. And so can I include them too? By simply this, this, understanding that they wish for happiness, just like me, they wish for safety and health and well-being. So when we recognize the humanity in others, even those who are very different from us, you know, there's some room for meta. They're not outside of the circle. We don't leave ourselves outside of the circle either. And what also happens with meta practice, and, and this could be some of the um, aversion people sometimes have for Metta. I mean, it's interesting. Some people love Metta. Other people, you know, it just, it just doesn't do it for them. I mean, I've led Metta and have people sort of scrunch up there. I'm like, oh, we're doing Metta, you know? Because what happens is that when we, are, when we get in touch with our own longing for happiness and safety and health, what it often illuminates is all those places where we aren't happy or we don't feel safe or we're not feeling any ease, right? This, this wish can, can illuminate our dukkha. It illuminates the first noble, the first noble truth. And so, you know, it's, it's metta can be a fairly intensive, intensive purification practice, right? Where stuff comes up, right? And so then how do we deal with it when, when the pain comes up? You know, in metta can show us, you know, the aversion or the lack of a positive relationship we have with ourselves. It can show us how armored we are, you know, and all of this can be, can be hard to, hard to bear. So that leads me into um, about self-compassion, right? We need a way, if we don't have a way of holding our own suffering, how are we going to 
move along the path. I mean, the first noble truth is like, we need to know suffering. We need to be able to, to look at it. We need to be able to accept. We need to be able to, to recognize it and to be able to, um, to hold it. So with self-compassion, well, first let me just, you know, compassion or, or uh, karuna is what arises when this heart of metta meets suffering, right? So it has the condition. So it's this caring heart of metta and it meets suffering, right? You, you don't generate compassion for somebody who's doing really well, right? If somebody's like in a really great space, it's like, oh, I have so much compassion for you. No, for the most time, and then there's maybe mudita, there's a different reaction. But when it, when it meets suffering, what arises is compassion. This wish that you not suffer. This wish that I can help in some way, right? So, you know, on this path, we need to be able to find ways to, to be with the dukkha and not fall into our usual strategies, whether it's, you know, pushing away or blaming or distracting ourselves, going numb, uh, um, immediately going to fixing mode, right? Um, so if we're going to follow this path, we need to find a way to, to hold our suffering that is supportive and sustainable. And there's a lot of suffering in this world. I mean, we're not just talking about our own personal suffering, but we're talking about holding the suffering of, of those near and dear, of holding the suffering of people in our community, people in this country, the whole entire world, the suffering of, of humans, of animals, insects. You know, we don't have to look far to find suffering. You know, we, we can look at the news, we talk to our friends. I mean, you just scratch the surface of any human being and there's a story of suffering there. So it could be our colleagues, strangers, and sometimes it can be, it can feel overwhelming. And particularly, you know, in these times that we live, I mean, just the level of, you know, with COVID and the death and the suffering, and it's like, how, how do you hold it all? So if we don't address our own dukkha, our own suffering, what happens is that we run the risk of not being able to be there for others. We burn out. Our, our, heart, our heart can harden because we can't take it anymore. We shut down. We build walls. So self-compassion is not selfish. You know, it's the old thing, you know, at the, on airplanes, you know, put your oxygen mask on first so that you're able to help others. And so this, so these, you know, self-compassion is a way of putting on your oxygen mask, of taking care of yourself so that you're available to, to help others. And our word, world so needs open, caring hearts, it needs people with wisdom and love. So. You know, compassion doesn't, you know, we don't tend to have a compassion practice like we do with metta. There's not, and you could, sort of it's almost the same practice where it's, it can be this radiation outward. Um, the phrases tend to be a lot simpler. May you be free of suffering. Um, I've done sort of compassion practice in um, where it's not necessarily used with, with phrases. It's more this sense of touching into the compassion and then sort of the sense of radiating out as big as I can. Um, but for ourselves, um, there is a, um, a practitioner, somebody was practicing Kristen Neff, um, who started as an insight meditation practitioner um, and uh, Chris Germer also there and they're both you know uh, psychologists um, developed a, a process for dealing for called mindful self-compassion 
and I can, mm, let me just really quickly. And, and if I don't get to all of it, you can always look it up. Mindful self-compassion, Kristen Neff, Chris Germer. Um, there's trainings on it, but, um, but really sort of this idea is like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling some, some hurt. So it's got three parts. One is mindfulness. We recognize, oh, this is suffering. You know, not, not the story of suffering, not this idea, but it's like, oof, you know, what that person said really hurt or that loss just kicks me in the gut, right? So we drop below the story and we figure out what's happening in our body mind. We're not trying to explain it. We're just trying to experience that, that the first noble truth, just the ouch. And we can name it sometimes. Oh, this is anger. Oh, this is anxiety. This is fear. Or sometimes it's just more guttural. It's just like, ouch. Right. And so it's, you know, like I said, this open heart has to meet the suffering. So it recognizes the suffering. And the next part um, they call the common humanity, but in Buddhism, it'd be like sentient beings. Um, but it's this acknowledgement that this remembering that, you know, I'm human and I'm going to have human suffering just like everyone else, right? So it goes from my suffering to a more part of, I'm part of this human, human tribe. And this is what we have to deal with. And then the last part is where we try to soothe ourselves or we're kind to ourselves. We treat ourselves like we would treat our best friend if they came to us with the problem. We don't go, oh my God, that's stupid. Get over it. And sometimes our, our own little minds say, it's just like, that's hard. That's hard. I hope you're, you know, you're, you're doing a great job. May you be okay. You know, the old heart rub, right, can also help. So that's what I have time for. Um, I might have to, if, does anybody have a, I think I have time for like maybe one question. Does anybody have a question? Did this make sense? Okay, Sylvie gave me the thumbs up that it made sense. So that's good. <laughs> Okay, well, if there are no questions, I think that we can just take a moment to, to dedicate the merit. So just allowing ourselves to settle, letting the words come into our heart or getting rid of what words we don't need. So if there's been any benefit in our coming together tonight with this intention of, of compassion, loving kindness for ourselves and all living beings, the whole world, May we spread that benefit far and wide to those near and dear, those known and unknown, those in the sea, the sky, the land, insects, humans, animals, everyone, no exception. May all living beings be happy. May all living beings be free from suffering. And may all living beings be free. So thank you very much for your kind attention. It's been lovely sitting with you all. And um, next week is David Lewis. And then after that, Howie should be back. But uh, David is a lovely, lovely teacher. I think you, you all know David. Or if you don't, get to know David. So. Thank you all again.
Take care. You can uh, unmute yourselves. Say good night. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay, you're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao, ciao. And I got through it without a cat jumping into my lap, so I'm very happy about it. <laughs> Night, Mark. Thank you, Mary. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Good night, Mary. Oh, you let me know when you want me to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. All right. So does anyone need anything before we log out? Mary, this is Linda. Let me fire up my video. I was just, you know, when during the break when you um, had temporarily forgotten to turn off your microphone and you're like, oh, where's that crazy cat in that gentle tone of voice? I was like, wow, that doesn't sound like me when I'm talking to my crazy cat. So I'm now totally, totally convinced that you're a truly good person. I heard no screaming, I heard no swearing. Uh, so yeah, very impressive. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Tell my cat I'm a bodhisattva, he seems to- Yeah, no, I could hear it, I could hear it. So good night, you guys, thank you so much. You. Okay, good night, Linda. All right. Okay, good night, Maureen. Good night, Mary. That was so wonderful. Thank you. Oh, oh, you're quite welcome. Thank you. All right, Mission Dharma. I think we can. I think we can log out. So thank you for your help, Howie. Oh sure. I had oh, a lovely yeah. time. It, it was a lovely talk. Oh good. Thank you. I know. I always get. But good. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye.